Welcome back to another exciting episode of The Switch, where we explore the life-changing moments of career transitions. We've called this episode From Zero to Hero. Today, we have a truly remarkable guest whose story will inspire you to believe in the incredible potential within all of us. A true trailblazer who is revolutionising the world of entrepreneurship and disability empowerment. Joining us is Hardeep Rai, the owner of Kaleidoscope, an organisation dedicated to helping people with disabilities to unleash their entrepreneurial spirit, reclaim their independence, purpose and financial freedom. Hardeep's story will challenge the stereotypes and misconceptions surrounding disabilities, from loss to empowerment, turning adversity into opportunity. Hardeep's experiences navigating adversity have shaped his unwavering commitment to positive impact. Prepare to be moved as he shares how personal circumstances propelled him to create Kaleidoscope and we explore why often people need to experience pain before making meaningful change. Hardeep's journey demonstrates the immense power of entrepreneurship as a catalyst for personal growth and fulfilment. Dive into the world of entrepreneurship with him as he reveals that passion, purpose and motivation drives successful businesses. Learn about the legacy Hardeep is creating through Kaleidoscope and its impact on countless lives and discover how your actions can contribute to leaving your own legacy. Get inspired, motivated and ready to make your switch. Hardeep, welcome and thank you so much for taking the time to join us on the switch. Thank you for having me, Chi. Delighted to be here. I've really been looking forward to speaking with you today, Hardeep. Um, we've, we've been working closely together at SJP um, to help us make financial services accessible for disabled people. To fill you in a little bit about myself, I work for the UK's largest provider of face-to-face financial advice, St. James's Place. I'm involved in their academy, which has so far trained over a thousand financial advisors, people from all walks of life who decided to make a switch of their own. So I know you have a lot of insight to give us and talk about your experiences and how you made your own career switch. Um, Would you mind telling us a little bit about how you came to pursue a career in financial services, first of all? Sure. Well, my coming from a conventional Asian background, my grandfather wanted to be, me to become either a lawyer, a doctor or an accountant. And so he really pushed me into one of those three sectors. And I sort of picked financial services as the one that I wanted to go into. So that's kind of how the interest originally started. And back in the mid 90s, I think fund management was the buzzword. You know, everyone was that was graduating from university wanted to go into fund management of some sort. So that's that's really how I got interested in financial services in the first place. G. And then working for a company like I did Gartmore for nearly 13 years was the most phenomenal experience because, you know, when you've got employers that are very, you know, sort of considerate and, and give you the opportunity to develop then you want to stay with them. And that's why I stayed with them, even though I had six different roles. But that was where the that was where the initial interest came from. Wow. I think a lot of people listening will will that will sound familiar, having that kind of family influence or, you know, wanting to please your parents. Um so yeah, I'm sure everybody will resonate with that. I was struck by reading your story, I was struck how often in changes in perspective came up. Um, so let's talk about one of the biggest challenges that you have faced in your life back in 2004. You were a survivor of the Boxing Day tsunami. Mm-hmm. That in itself must have been terrifying. How has that influenced your life since then? So I think I, I would say, G, that I've been, I've been fortunate up until 2004 in my life in that most things had gone according to the way that I had planned. You know, I had a great family upbringing. I had a lot of love that I was surrounded by. Um, I was successful in my career. I had a respectable amount of wealth, which enabled me to do the things that I wanted to do. So I was never really short of anything. And I'd never really had an as- adverse experience, I would I would say quite honestly. And then in 2004, we were going to um, Thailand for Ket. And it was a boxing, it was it was a sort of, it wasn't quite a honeymoon, but it was a, it was the first holiday, that major holiday I'd had after I got married. And um you know, it, you know, they always say things happen for a reason. On Christmas Day, we landed in Jordan. I had a drink. I got a very upset tummy. So when we actually got to Phuket on the Boxing Day in the morning, our original plan had been to go for a walk on the beach, get up early, go for a walk at seven or eight o'clock in the morning. But because I was sick, that didn't happen. Now, if that did happen, I wouldn't be here on your podcast today because, you know, everyone that went on that walk was was no longer. And so... You know, it was it was the most remarkable thing you would ever see in your life where, you know, you're sitting down in a in a restaurant having your breakfast and all of a sudden you, there's this wall of water that literally comes in um, and, you know, it just kind of 
just takes over, just takes over everything. It's sheer panic, sheer pandemonium. And I think the, the, coming to your question about changing perspectives, the thing that hit me the hardest in that situation was there were people around me that were dying. There were people around me that wanted to run, but they couldn't run because they had broken legs. If I close my eyes now, I can still imagine and see some of the injuries they had. They were reaching out to me with their hands, you know, calling to me, you know, screaming. Yet I was thinking about myself and I was thinking about my wife at that time. And do you know, G, that was a really difficult thing for me because, you know, I was I was running away from people that I knew needed help. But in a way, I also knew that if I didn't, you know, if I did stop to help them and I didn't run away, then I wouldn't be around. So so again, that was that was probably one of the first things that, that hit me really hard, which was that that human desire to help I couldn't do. And then the second thing that hit me was, you know, we saw we've got money, we'll be able to get off the island, we'll be able to book flights, you know, it will be fine. It wasn't like that. You know, it wasn't like that. It didn't matter whether you did have money, whether you didn't have money. As a human being, you were equal to everybody else. And then there was a moment where we where we heard that there was going to be another another wave, a second wave. And in that moment, it was all about, are we going to survive or are we not going to survive? And we didn't have mobile phones. We couldn't communicate with the world. And it was all about just survival, living. What are we going to do? And I remember sitting on a bench at the top of the hill with, with my wife at the time. And, and we said, well, if we had to go, we held hands. And we said, if we had to go, at least we're together, you know. And so that was the, that was that three days, like the film, The Impossible, was the first time that I really understood what it felt like to be stripped of everything that you had that made you feel entitled right all of a sudden you had nothing and that was a real that was that that was the first time to you it was a real shock to the system for me and like you say an absolute level it doesn't matter how many zeros there are in anybody's bank you've all got to you've all got to fight for survival um well i'm very glad that those turn of fates mean that you are here with us today as i'm sure you are and and i still can't believe that that's part of your story uh, but thank you so much for sharing. Um, so now you are a multifaceted entrepreneur. Um, you've worked within hedge funds, within wealth management, private equity, and you've even worked with James Kahn, the former Dragon's Den member. I have. And you are now a founder of Kaleidoscope Investments. Can you talk about the crossover in these roles and the experiences? Have your skills and expertise developed across time? And what would you encourage other people to do to develop this kind of skill set and resilience? So uh, that's a hugely loaded question. I will tackle that the best I can, G. So I think the, the first thing that I would say is that being an entrepreneur is probably something that is inbuilt within most people. Okay. I think most of us have this entrepreneurial streak. The question is whether or not you're prepared to take the risk and release that thought process and turn it into something practical, make it into a business. And I think for most of my career, although I was working in financial services and although I was working full time, I was always thinking about doing something on the side, G. So I was always thinking about, I want to do this, I want to do that. I had different ideas. I was sort of raising bits of money here and there. So I was experimenting. But I think what one of the things that Ishan taught me, and I realized with Ishan is because of the the hit with with his his his, you know, what happened with his disability and when he was born. I always looked at that as an opportunity to think that, okay, now might be a time to realize that entrepreneurial dream and spirit that I've always had. So, so I think that, that personal motivation and that personal drive and that personal reason for wanting to do that was a very, very important factor in actually making me step into the world of entrepreneurship. Um, so that was one thing. And then the other thing, which is really obvious, is you've got to have a passion about something that's very, very close to your heart. Now, if you asked me up until 2006, would disability be close to my heart? Never in a million years. You know, the only thing I knew about disability was literally blue badge bays, and that was it, right? I didn't really know anything about disability. So there's got to be a cause that's close to your heart that's making you feel that you want to switch, right? And that is really important. And, and to be honest, whenever we talk about entrepreneurship with our, with our sort of disabled entrepreneurs, I spend a lot of time on purpose, motivation, 
drive, you know, reasons. You know, if you want to go into a business, what what do you want to do? Why do you want to do that if you want to make a switch? You know, what are your reasons? And I realized when I was in financial services, so many people that I was surrounded by were doing work, but for the wrong reasons. You know, most of us just want to sort of work, or many people do work because of the money, because of paying the bills, but they don't necessarily have that level of job satisfaction. And I think that when I look back on my career now, I probably transitioned just about at the right time. I did it towards the late 30s, early 40s. So I had that moment where I had a lot of work experience. I understood large organizations. I understood how to interact with people. But I also had a passion and a drive to be able to start something on my own. So so I think the first thing about any switch is really understanding what your why is, why you're doing that switch. And then I think the second thing that's really important is once you've understood that why, you need to know about the how, right? You need to make sure that you know, you know, you've really thoroughly understood why you're switching. And we live in a fantastic world right now whereby there is so much information on the internet about business, so many courses, so many things you can do to start learning about how to start business. So I think those would be the, the the two things that would be very important to me. And of course, Eastern was one of my one of my major drivers for starting my own business. That was going to be my next question. So you started the Kaleidoscope Group. What were the motivations behind that? Talk us through your son's story. So Eastern was the the second major life changing event for me. You know, I was at the I'd say I was at the pinnacle of my career. G. You know, I was earning well. I was sort of you know I I, I was in a very good position status wise. Um, everything was great. Everything was literally great. And a few days before he was born, you know, as most parents, you, you begin to feel a little bit anxious. When's he going to arrive? And you know what's going to happen? And we knew that Ishan was going to be our only son because my wife at the time was slightly older. So we knew that there were, probably wasn't going to be another chance of another baby. So we had put everything into 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 Ishan. And we've done the thing that most parents do, which is, this is the school he's going to go to. This is the person he's going to marry. This is where he's, you know, we kind of mapped out his life before he was even born. And then at the last minute, when we were in the hospital, his meter was being dilated. There was a, there was a last minute birthing complication in that his heart rate suddenly dropped from 136 beats per minute to around 60 beats per minute. And it happened within a matter of within a matter of probably two to three minutes, G. And suddenly everyone came into the room. They rushed her into the um, surgery room and they performed a crash cesarean. And during that time, Ishan lacked 17 minutes of oxygen to his brain. So it was, a, it was what they call a global brain injury. And then I'll never forget this moment to this day, which was that I was, there was a nurse that was sort of calming me down. And she said, look, you're going to see your son in a minute and you're going to hear a scream. You're going to hear him cry. And I waited a long time for that cry, G, but it didn't, it didn't happen. And instead, what I saw was a lady running with a limp child into, you know, from one room to another. And at that point, I knew this was something pretty serious. And fast forward, you know, a few hours, they, they told me, look, your son is very sick. If he survives, you know, it's going to be a miracle, but we're going to put him on a life support machine system and, and so on. And, and I think I remember one, one moment I remember then was sort of the first thing you think is, is this really happening? You know, is it me? I can't believe that this is happening. And, and the second thing I remember is being in a lift lobby. Okay. And there were loads of people around me. But I couldn't hear anything, G. It was like there was a sound of silence, right? And the closest thing I can liken it to was a sea... You know when you've got a shell and you put a shell to your ear, a seashell? You know you get that hollow sound, that hollow feeling? That's what it sounded like for me. It sounded like I was suddenly projected into a new world. There was hollowness. There was silence. I couldn't believe what was going on. And that was the beginning of my new chapter in life. You know, at that point, I thought, okay, life is not never going to be the same again. And of course, you think in the initial phases, don't worry, I've got money, we'll get the best doctors, we'll get the best this, the best that. But what you don't realize is when it comes to health, and in particular disability, and in particular brain damage, you can't reverse it, right? It's just one of those things that happens to you. So, so that was a, that was a, that was the beginning of a period for me of depression, you know, postnatal depression, mental health challenges, 
you know, to be very honest, you know, sometimes suicidal thoughts, you know, when over, over a period of years, you know, it's very, very difficult when you when you have a child that, that you know is not going to be the child that you wanted. Um, and then you come to terms with what that child is going to be, you know, it's a very difficult transition. And so, you know, I think that 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 had a huge impact on me for the first few years. But the funny thing is, after a period of time, and funnily enough, one of the things that helped me to come to terms with that was becoming a Christian. So faith actually really helped me also to become, you know, much more accepting of Ishin. And that was when I started to become into a right place to think about, right, how could I take the situation that's been very adverse, very negative in many ways, um, and turn it into something more positive? And that's how that's how I started to think about um, Kaleidoscope and, and building that as a business. Now, Hardy, we've spoken on this topic before. You've been kind enough to share your story with SJP as part of our internal training. Um, and I just wondered if you wouldn't mind sharing, if it's not too painful, how people started to react when you returned to work. What were the reactions of people? How did that feel for you? Yeah, it's a really good question, G. So I'll, on the professional side first, when I when I returned to work, you know, I worked on a trading floor and, um, you know, I was very well known within the business. Everybody, you know, literally there's 200 people on the floor. I knew all 200 people. But when I when I walked in into the business, um, there was this sort of deathly silence, <laughs> which is very unusual for a trading floor, right? And and the poor guys they didn't know they didn't really know what to say, right? You know, do we congratulate Hardy? You know, I walked to my desk. I thought, is there going to be a balloon? Is it going to be some chocolate? Is it going to be some cake? It was going to be anything, and and there wasn't anything. I just walked to my my standard desk, and that in a way already made my heart sink because I thought to myself, you know, people could have at least maybe thought to do something like that for me. But and then and then you know on that same day, I sort of walked past. I remember walking close to the kitchen, but not going into the kitchen and hearing somebody say very innocently, "God, we don't know. Do, do we congratulate Hardy? Do we commiserate Hardy? What do we do? You know." And it was that feeling of people being awkward around me and around disability that was the first experience that I had of realizing or, or understanding that in the workplace, a lot of the time, people don't actually know what to do. But because they don't do anything, it puts you in a worse environment or mindset because you think that they're, you think that they're judging you or you think they don't want to know you anymore. You know, you're already in a very heightened emotional state. So you think the worst Whereas from their point of view, they're dying to come up to you. They're dying to ask you how you are. They're dying to give you a hug, but they don't, right? Because they're too afraid of how it might react. Um, so that was very, very difficult for me, G. You know, and I had to really take a few people and start talking to them and helping them to feel comfortable and almost pumping myself up to feel like the normal hardy in order to make them feel more comfortable to approach me and and the learning from that is that for any of us that go through these difficult times you know absolutely go up to that individual do not hold back it doesn't matter if you actually say something wrong it doesn't matter if you say how are you and and it's a really silly question to ask because they may you know they may not be very well because of what's just happened but it's still a conversation there'll still be that level of appreciation I would have greatly appreciated it if people did that. So so I think that's a very important thing. And I think the world we're in now, especially post-COVID, it's even more important than ever to be open about how you're feeling and to be supportive of people. And then on the personal side, so that was the professional side. On the personal side, I started to lose a lot of friends. I started to have people say to me, wow, look at Hardy. What did he do karmically in his life to deserve a disabled child? What did that disabled child do to deserve to be disabled? He or she must have done something really bad in his past life to be punished in the way he's being punished. And, you know, the problem in life is sometimes scriptures, you know, I'm a Sikh and my mom's a Hindu. Sometimes scriptures can be misinterpreted by human beings. And I think a lot of people were, were doing that with, with what was going on, which was becoming very, very painful for me and for us. You know, I remember... Again, my wife at the time wouldn't even take Ishan out, you know, for walks and things because of, you know, fear of judgment, especially in the Asian community, unfortunately, going back 16 years, you know, people were very much that way. So I experienced a lot of discrimination, a lot of unfair judgment, 
a lot of things that I probably did myself. That's the irony is I'm, I'm sad to admit it. And I would have done it through unconscious bias, but sometimes I would have maybe done that towards people previously. But when it happened to me, I thought, oh my God, now, now I know how these people feel. Now I realize, now I understand. And I think that changed my inner core, G. And that made me realize that, oh my God, people that communicate differently, people with disabilities, people that have been judged, they are still real human beings with real desires and real stories and real capabilities, real heart and genuine perspective. Why are we not giving them the opportunities that they deserve? Just because we don't understand what they're going through, like people stopped understanding what I was going through. So, so that was something that shook me to my core. And I think that even till today, sharing it with you right now, it's always, it's always a reminder of that soreness of how you feel. You know, I even had people say to me, sometimes they didn't want clothes from Ishin because those clothes belong to a disabled child. And that might bring some bad luck to their child if they wear Ishin's clothes. You know, it's, it's, it's incredible what, what some people have in terms of superstition in their mind. But the fact of the matter is, I experienced it and that's what I went through. Wow. Well, look, thank you for sharing with the audience and also for your, your advice is, you know, don't be scared of saying something. Somebody would much rather you make a small mistake with, with you know, without intention than, than say nothing at all. Um, yes. So we've, as I say, at SJP, we've benefited from the amazing work and, and training that you and your team deliver to help organisations on best practice to support disabled workers. How do you draw non-disabled clients to your work? Um, how does the work impact the organisations that you work with and the disabled people that you support? And how do inclusive practices set the foundations for success? So I think the, the first thing, the most important thing about disability in, in answering that question is we have to help to change the perspectives and the perceptions that people have towards disabled people. Okay, so that's the first thing. And I think Kaleidoscope is on a major, major mission to do this, right? And and I think for the reasons that I've explained already, you know, because I've seen it and I felt it and I know that judgment, we're here to help people and organizations to realize that actually a person with a disability is not just someone that's got a physical disability or is it sitting in a wheelchair or holding a crutch, right? A person with a disability could, could be someone that's got an invisible disability, an intellectual disability, you know, you wouldn't even know that they had a disability in addition to physical. So there's a lot of education in that. And so what we've done with our training programs, as you've seen, is I bring people with different disabilities to the table to do the training. So you can interact with someone that's blind or you can interact with someone that's neurodiverse. You can interact with someone that's got a hearing impairment and actually realize that they can make you laugh in the same way that anyone else can make you laugh. And they can do the same things that they might just do in a slightly different way, right? So there's a big education piece there in terms of helping people to understand why people with disabilities should be given opportunities. And let's not forget, during COVID, the entire world, gee, became disabled for a period of time. We were all at home. We were all stuck. We couldn't do anything, right? And the irony is disabled people in those days were actually in their pinnacle of, you know, they knew what it was like because they were already, many of them were already isolated. So, so there's the educational piece around disability and giving people the opportunity. And then we live in a capitalistic commercial world where money, unfortunately, is at the heart of most people's decisions, right? So then it's helping people to understand that actually these people with disabilities can help you to become more profitable as an organization if you give them the opportunity to do that, right? So that's the next education process. And a lot of what we train on is helping them to understand how can you leverage somebody that's thinking differently to your advantage as a business? There's nothing wrong with that, right? There's nothing wrong with that at all. In fact, you'd be very smart to do that because you're helping that person with a disability progress their career and do better. And you're actually helping the commerciality of your business too. It's a bit like our project. I know for a fact that, you know, everything that you're doing with, with this project is for the genuine right reasons in terms of corporate social responsibility, ESG, wanting to do the right thing. But ultimately, in the longer term, the disability community is a community we hope you'll be able to generate some business from too, right? So that is a, it is a win-win. And it needs to be that way in order to be sustainable. Because if it's not then what happens is people do one-off projects because they feel good about it and because they want to put it in their annual report, but then it doesn't continue. 
And so for me, linking that educational element between making sure that people understand that disabled people can bring a different perspective to your business, can help you to become more profitable. And us training you or people training you on how to maximize the value of that individual is a very important thing, right? So I think to answer your your question, those to me, the two points are really important, the perception point and then supporting that individual through their employment to be able to really think differently and then you listening to them to be able to start generating some more money and profitability for the business. And I also think that when you start, you know, if you're typically an employer, you know, you might be a non-disabled employer, as you were saying. So somebody that typically hasn't recruited people with disabilities before. Um, I know that's a fearful thing to do and that's a courageous thing for me to say, but the fact is, a lot of employers are very scared of recruiting or working with disabled people because of the protected characteristics issue, because of the negativity they can read in the press if they get it wrong, if they hire somebody and things go wrong, then you know they could be sued. There's a lot of there's a lot of fear. But much of that fear G is misplaced. It genuinely is misplaced. You just need to be able to understand the people that you're bringing on board. You need to be able to know that the government, through access to work, for instance, will pay for a lot of their equipment if you're putting them into place. There are lots of training programs that, you know, your employees can go on that will help them to interact with those people to maximize their benefits. So as long as you you make sure that there's the right training and there's the right support, then things should not go wrong. Things typically go wrong when you haven't got these things in place. So I would encourage all the listeners that were in that sort of non-disabled employee world to think very openly and actually follow the SJP example, funnily enough, of of what you're doing to recruit more people with disabilities too. Absolutely. So you started the Kaleidoscope Investments in 2014. And since then, Kaleidoscope Group has grown and holistically covers the challenges that are faced by disabled people looking to get into business. What continues to motivate you to support and empower disabled people to become successful entrepreneurs and how does the group help them to do this and how do you continue to maximize your own thinking and potential so again that's a very latest question (laughs) so i think first of all let me let me come back to what motivates me first and i'll answer this question really really openly okay i mean I, i have been doing so but in particular do you know working with people with disabilities g is is not easy Okay, it's difficult. I mean, working with anybody is difficult, but working with people with disabilities is particularly difficult, especially with some of those that that may have certain conditions around mental health, bipolar, paranoid, schizophrenia, active. There are lots of conditions that can be, you know, that that are conditions that most people wouldn't even think about going near when it comes to entrepreneurship, you know, if you're thinking about business. but actually, I I have done, I have done, and I've done that because I've wanted to understand what these individuals are really capable of doing, despite what their conditions are. So, so a lot of the time that can be a very, and the reason I say this is because I often have to dig deep to find my motivation to continue. I often have to, because you can meet a lot of people that will be very ungrateful right? You know, you can do so many things, so many things. But at the end of the day, if you don't do that one thing right, but you've done, you know, nine other things, sorry, if you don't do that last thing right, despite the fact that you've done nine other things right, you'll be judged on that one thing that you got wrong, not the nine that you got right. So so my motivation comes from Ishan primarily. Okay. So I know that I still have to, I want to make sure that there is a legacy between me and Ishan and, and, and we leave something behind. I feel very led by the Lord in terms of what I'm doing as well. I feel that I'm in a position where I'm meant to be where I am and I'm meant to be doing what I'm doing. And also, gee, my team, the loyalty and the commitment that my team have shown me over the last eight years is a massive driver for me. You know, I really want them to be successful because of their commitment, because of the the real what they've what they showed me in terms of their their drive and their energy and their enthusiasm for what we're doing. But I suppose, you know, the thing that, that motivates me the most still is when I get lovely messages from people that we are helping. You know, and they these are real heartfelt messages from so many people with disabilities that will that be saying to me that you know, um, if it was not for Kaleidoscope, you know, nobody would have listened to us. We've been sitting on our idea for 10 years and, you know, lots of things where you suddenly realize that you're helping somebody to 
find their purpose and do something better in their life. That's a huge motivator for me. Okay. So, so those are the things that continue to motivate me and continue to keep me going. And I have very big dreams as well. You know, one day I want Kaleidoscope Investments to influence the World Bank into how other governments in different countries across the world treat disabled entrepreneurs, right? So there's a big piece there. But the other piece, which you touched on as well, is the recruitment piece and making sure that people with disabilities um, can actually find jobs as well, right? Because not everybody wants to become an entrepreneur. And that's why we set up the recruitment business that we did to give them the opportunities to realize their dreams from a recruitment perspective. So that's why we did the bit, you know, with, with recruitment. And of course, you already know about the training and why we do it. But I think that, that, that drive and that entrepreneurial purpose is critical for anyone, you know, coming back to the theme of the program that is wanting to make a switch, you know, realizing that when you are in your own business, there are going to be hard times. You're going to hit brick walls. It's going to be very easy to think, you know what, forget this. I'm just going to go back to the city or I'm going to go back to get a full-time job or a part-time job. And if you don't have the right reasons to drive you at that point, then you're probably going to slip backwards. And getting into a negative spiral when you are an entrepreneur is actually a very unhealthy thing to do. Very unhealthy thing to do. You want to make sure you're surrounded by people that will lift you and leverage you when you are feeling in those negative ways. Um, so that's what I would say in answer to your question. Thank you. You mentioned your amazing team and I've met them. So would you mind giving us like one example of one of your team and someone might have a disability and be impaired in one way, but I feel that that gives them superpowers in other ways. So do you want to just give an example of someone in your team? The easiest example is Tony Washington, who who you know well. Tony Washington um, lost his sight over a period of time, unfortunately. So he was able to see and then gradually lost his sight. But actually, Tony, um, and actually people that are blind, unfortunately, get judged in the harshest of ways, G, as, as you know, right, as well, because people make big assumptions around blind people. But Tony's ability now not to see has enabled him to use his other senses in a way that most of us wouldn't be able to use. And his attention to detail, the way he listens to things, the way he hears things, the fact that he can't see a picture makes him ask questions that might be really obvious, right? But we haven't thought about those questions. And he is by far the best critique of business plans that I have ever come across because he just looks at the facts. He just looks at the black and white. He doesn't look at anything else, right? And so his ability to analyze and conclude and come to conclusions and think differently is absolutely staggering, absolutely staggering. And so I think that he is a class example of somebody that, you know, most people would just, you know, sort of just think he's not capable. And yet he's probably the most capable member of my team, just just by the fact that he thinks in a completely different way. I love that example. Thank you for sharing. Now, this is the point where we're going to look at the light bulb moment when someone makes the switch to a whole new realm of success. So there have been lots of switch moments in your life. Why was the birth of your son, Ishan, the one that pushed you to a new level? There was, I think, the reason he pushed me to a new level was because I realized, this is, actually, I'm only just realizing this realization through this question, G, and the way that you've asked it, funnily enough, is that he made me realize that I can't spend my money anymore in a way that's going to help me. So if I buy a new watch, it's not going to make me happy because ishan has got brain damage. If I buy a new car, it's not going to make me feel any better because ishan has got brain damage, right? So what he made me realize is that wherever I spend my money, I'm actually not going to be happy. And therefore, I had to think very deeply about what is it that I'm going to do in my life now that's going to make me happy. And that was the beginning of my thought process for searching to the switch, right? It was like, that's um, it's the first time I've articulated it in that way, G, actually, but that was that was what it was. It was not, not being able to spend my money in a way that was going to make me happy anymore. That was the thing that made me realize I need to do something different in my life because I'm not getting that internal satisfaction. And um, 
and sort of um, joy. So that was my first, that was my first thing. And if I may, I'm just going to add a second one to that, G. Okay. The second one was actually when I met my business partner, Shane Bradby. Um, Shane has got a condition called Friedrich's ataxia and he's in a wheelchair and he, he came to see me and I'll never forget this. We were at a restaurant. We were, we were in a hotel restaurant and, you know, I was helping him with his food. We were having a chat. And the minute he told me, G, that people with disabilities really struggled to start their own businesses. And I had that knowledge of the investment world. For me, there was a light bulb moment over a curry where I thought, oh my God, this could be amazing. I know I want to do something with disability, um, but I didn't know what until I met Shane. And the minute Shane said that, it was just like the missing piece to Jigsaw Puzzle for me, G. So it took some years to get to that point. You know, so your purpose of switching, you know, it may not come immediately. It may take some time to build, but there will be a moment that sort of the first moment is the why do you want to switch? And the next moment is the how are you going to switch? So Isham was the why, okay, and then Shane was the how. Amazing. Now, you did talk about some of the challenges you faced in those early initial years, both in personal and yeah. in business. People started treating you differently. You had your own um, thought processes going on. How did you how did you overcome that time? If I had to think about it from the very beginning, it was really difficult at first. Um, it did get me down. I did go through that postnatal depression phase, especially when I started losing friends. But then, you know, when you've got close people around you that you do respect and you do trust, um, and you sort of try and turn to faith as well. Those were the things that began to slowly build me up again. And it took time, okay, because from in 2008, I did leave Gartmore. There was an opportunity to take voluntary redundancy, and I did take voluntary redundancy. So I had a decent amount of money. I took about a year off, and I tried to rebuild myself, and I tried to refocus on Ishan as well. And I sort of started coming to terms with what it was that he could do, rather than what it was that he couldn't do, right? Because, you know, we always have these benchmarks in our heads about what what we are able to, what we think that child is going to do, but we have to go at their pace, not our pace. And so there were lots of small realizations over a period of time that started helping me to realize that I need to change my perspective. But if I'm very honest, I think I think faith played a big part in helping me to become stronger, G, you know, and just kind of accepting that, I had a smaller universe now of friends and, and family that were around me, but I was going to work more with them to rebuild myself. And then having that that business focus that I was beginning to build up on as well got very exciting for me. And then, of course, the James Kahn piece that you mentioned, you know, James happened in the first sort of within that first eight year period. And to be honest, that did give me a lot of confidence back that I had lost and you know, we talk about the zero to hero piece, you know, there was there was a time when I had gone from hero to zero when I left the city, you know, party wasn't really known anybody any anymore, you know, and when you have to ask for help in life, it's the hardest thing sometimes. And I did ask people for help when I was looking for my next job. And believe it or not, my sister knew the lawyer that worked with James Kahn. And that sort of got me ultimately the job that I had with him in, in four days and took me sort of... Uh, really built my confidence up and, and really helped me to get back on my feet. Fantastic. Um, and what would you say are the key traits that have fueled your drive and sense of purpose since the birth of Ishid? And in your mind, would you be able to answer, have they been instinctive or are they things that you've had to work on consciously? It's a really good question. I think the, and you'll hear this from any entrepreneur you speak to, okay, the number one skill that any entrepreneur is going to need to have in business is resilience, right? It's just, you, you, there, there is no other word. You just have to keep going. You have to keep going, right? Um, and, and you know, there will be, now that doesn't mean that you keep flogging a dead horse, so to speak, right? You know, if, you, if your idea isn't working, you have to be ready to pivot. But you have to have that drive and that purpose and that goal that you're working towards. And if you have to take different routes to get there, then so be it. You have to be savvy enough. But that resilience and that drive is absolutely critical. Okay. So that's the, that's the number one thing that you must have. And the number two thing you must have is you, you do need to listen to your intuition. Intuition is a very important thing. And intuition, I believe, is a God given gift to every single human being. We have this conscience that bites us when you know that something isn't quite right. And very often you might sort of not listen to it or you might just leave it by the wayside because the bigger picture seems like the right way to go. 
listen to your intuition. It's very, very important. And the more experienced you are, the more attuned your, in- your intuition is. But I think the, you know, the key skill for anyone that's going to think about switching is is that resilience um, and 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 plan, you know, have a plan as to how you're going to do what you're going to do. Don't just think, oh, I want to do this and I'm going to jump in with, you know, all, you know, my entire focus and, and, and everything. Make sure you do it in a gradual, intelligent, planned way so there's a structure to it. Thank you. Such great advice. Um, so what would you say to people listening who might be on the verge of a change in their lives or their careers? What key things have you learned from your experiences and how has this influenced your professional point of view? The first thing I'd say is congratulations. <laughs> I, I, I will really respect the fact that you're thinking about a switch because we only have one chance in this life. We just have one chance. And life flies by very, very quickly and life can change at any moment. And the last thing you want to do is say, I wish or if only or, you know, I wish I would have done that or I could have done that you must take that move and you must make that move. So I congratulate you for thinking about wanting to move in the first place. But the only thing I would say is that make sure that the move that you're thinking about is a realistic one and do have a plan in terms of how you're going to achieve the goals that you want to achieve. Because what you don't want to do is make a switch and then be disappointed. You don't want to revert back to the place that you came from if you can avoid it. So make sure you take the right advice, the right guidance, speak to the right people, look at role models, potentially get a mentor, you know, but there's a lot of information that is available for you to do that sort of switch. So, so I encourage a switch. And I think that the most beautiful thing that I love about, you know, being a business owner is the independence and the freedom it gives me, um, you know, to be able to run a business in the way I want to run a business and combine that with the quality of life. So I regularly work from different places as you know G you know be working from Windsor Great Park Savile Garden one day you know I could work from an aerodrome another day you know I could work in my home the next day I could work from my car the next day having that flexibility and being in an environment that inspires you is really important because you know I think that when you do work for yourself it's a lonely thing to do right it's a lonely thing to do unless you're working as part of a team um, and and so you need to keep yourself motivated. And in order to keep yourself motivated, you need to be around things that motivate and uplift you. So think about your well-being. Think about those beautiful things in nature that sort of, you know, really in, make you feel good. And then try and be around those things when you're when you're actually working so that you feel inspired because constantly feeling that that inspiration is is very important to keep you going and to keep you successful. Fantastic. And how can our listeners build the skills they need to make the career transition easier? I think actually beginning to listen to stories of other entrepreneurs that have made it, I think would be a really good starting point. And and I don't ask me to give you any podcasts because I, I, I couldn't think of any, but I know that there are countless people that have been very successful that make it very easy to understand how you should start your own business. They make it very easy to understand. Um, and you can learn within a few hours of listening to people what you need to do. But the thing that I would always say to somebody that's very obvious, but really basic, is that you must know, obviously you need to know what your product is that you're selling, but you must have an idea of who you're going to sell that to and how you're going to reach those individuals. Because ultimately that is the that is the single most, you know, usual failing point for most businesses is that either they haven't identified their customer properly or if they have identified the customer how do they reach that customer how do they get the ear of that customer that's the thing that most people have to really think about so i would say to you if you are thinking about business whatever it is you're thinking about doing make sure you really understand the demographic that you're going to be looking at and try and carve out a niche within that demographic. So again, if I were to just pick our project, you know, if you are doing something in the disability space, you know, and you're doing something in the neurodiverse arena, think about how you're going to target the neurodiverse people in that arena and what is your route going to be to market before you make that jump. So I would say do a lot of research, do a lot of groundwork, make sure you've got a proper business plan, a proper idea of what it is you're going to do before you actually start doing it. Fantastic. And what do you find are, are sort of common hurdles or blockers that people have when they're sort of looking for confidence or determination to thrive in their even their current or their future endeavours? 
So if I think about myself, and I'm going to use an Arnold Schwarzenegger word here, it's the uh, naysayers, okay? So people that you're surrounded by that say, don't waste your time, don't do this, it's not going to work, go back to the city, go back to what you do, get a regular salary. There are a lot of people that we're surrounded by in this world that are not prepared to take the risk that you're prepared to take as someone that's going to switch your career, right? They're just, they're just not prepared to take that risk. And you almost need to stay away from those people because their negativity is not going to help you, right? And that's a really important point. I'm glad you asked that question because other people's negativity is definitely going to influence your motivation and your, your, it doesn't matter who you are, right? It's going to happen to you because we're still, we're still human beings. Um, and those people may not have the drive or understand your business in the way that you do, right? So, so I think, I think there's, that's the first thing, the naysayers, stay away from the naysayers. And, and, and even if they are saying things for your benefit, unfortunately, you and I discussed this before, life is such that you only, you only really understand or make a change when you feel pain. Okay. So let's imagine you as an entrepreneur, you did something, you had all these naysayers and then your business failed. Okay. That failure and that emotion that's linked to that failure is what's going to drive your next success, right? Because unfortunately, you know, we as human beings are built in a certain way that pain teaches us, right? Love teaches us to a certain degree, but in my experience, pain teaches us more, right? So, so failure leads to pain, which actually leads to learning, which ultimately leads to success. That's the way to go. And then the other thing is statistics, right? You can get blown away by statistics of failure and negativity and, you know, there's too much competition out there. It's not going to work. I'm not saying you don't pay attention to that, but if you listen to some of the most successful people in life, they don't even look at the competition. They just look at their end customers and the service they're providing to the end customers. And that's what drives them. And that's what I would say as well, G. That's a brilliant answer. Thank you. Um, and would you say that an ideal time to make a significant change in your life or is there never an ideal time? Um, and should we always be ready to embrace it? I think I'd actually choose the last point that you said. I think I would always be ready to embrace change. There will be times in people's lives when something can happen that instigates a change, okay, that instigates the change in the mindset. But then that time between it sort of being instigated and actually happening could be a long time. It's like Ishin happened in 2006. Kaleidoscope happened in 2014. That's an eight-year gap, right? So although that change was there in instigation, it didn't actually manifest for almost eight years later. But I think that you, if you, if you feel that there is a fire in your belly and there's something that's telling you, I want to do something more, I want to change, start writing, start thinking about a vision and a mission and a goal for what you're trying to achieve. Put it on paper, put it on black and white, and then say, if that's my vision, mission, and goal, how am I going to how am I going to do that? And that means that when you you will then you will then know intuitively when the right thing will happen because maybe people will start talking about something and you'll be like, Oh, actually I was thinking about doing that. And that will be a reminder or a prompt for you to do it. So look out for the signs, but I would say you should be ever ready. Brilliant. And as someone running your own business, supporting disabled business owners and working with organisations to make businesses more accessible and inclusive, can you paint a picture of what success means to you? So I think success means to me, let's say in the recruitment space, working with an employer that actually starts to recruit disabled people and embeds that process into their everyday business, right? Whereby, and it sounds counterintuitive to Kaleidoscope, but whereby you don't eventually need organizations like Kaleidoscope unless you're troubleshooting or unless there's an issue, but embedding disability and embedding diversity into everyday natural business, I think is a very important thing. And I often think, again, I know this is a bad thing to say, but there's so much training that, that people could be getting just by reading, just by watching YouTube videos, just by watching new movies, right? You know, and actually, that's what we should be doing to train ourselves around disability. You know, there they, they should be, people should be leveraging those resources a lot more than they are. Um, and I think in the, so, so I think employers recruiting more disabled people and disabled people progressing in their careers and staying with organizations for a longer time, but progressing is definitely a success. But the big, the jewel in the crown for me is really entrepreneurship and 
getting companies, governments around the world, the World Bank, the UN, promoting disabled entrepreneurship and having a means for people to be able to start their own businesses with disabilities around the world. You know, that that for me is what success looks like. Fantastic. And what about personally for you? Personally for me, I think having my son near me as I grow old is probably the most important thing that I think about G. You know, um, and I don't consider myself old yet, by the way, as I grow older, I should say, right? You know, because I feel very young at heart at the moment. But Ishan at the moment is in a care home. And I want Ishan to be closer to me, ideally even living with me in a sort of a nicer neck. So making Kaleidoscope successful enough so that I can do that in the way that I want to do that is a very important personal goal for me because I feel that he and I are very aligned and have a very, very strong connection. So I want I want to be able to do that. Um, and then I want to make the people that have given me their years and time, I want to make them successful. I really do. I want I want them to feel that they're a part of something that's become a legacy, that's become a business, that's going to live on, it's going to really change their lives. So because there's so many of the people I work with are like my friends, G. So I feel that's still a personal thing, even though it sounds professional, but they are they are still great friends. So I want them to be successful too. Hardy, thank you so much for being on The Switch. Your story has been so fascinating and extremely inspiring. And the nuggets of gold that you've shared with people, I'm sure will help many. God, I can't believe time flew by so quickly. <laughs> no. I really got, I re- do you know, actually, G, I'm not just saying this. I, I realised a few things through talking to you in the way that I did. So I should thank you for that as well. Brilliant. Especially that switch moment about the purpose thing and the money. That was uh, that insightful was really, for me. Really insightful. Really, really insightful. How can people find you? How can they reach out? Is there anything you want to share with our audience? Sure, they're welcome to reach out to me on LinkedIn or they can by all means go to our website, which is www.kaleidoscope.group. Thank you. Thanks for coming on the show. Thank you for having me, G. It's been a pleasure. In this powerful episode of The Switch featuring Hardeep Rai, the visionary owner of Kaleidoscope, we were privileged to gain invaluable insights and advice on entrepreneurship, inclusivity and personal growth. Here are six key messages that Hardeep shared, which are bound to leave a lasting impact. Number one, say something, even if it's small. Hardeep emphasised the importance of reaching out and offering support to somebody in a challenging situation, even if you're unsure of what to say. No matter how brief, a genuine conversation can make a significant difference. Don't let the fear of saying something wrong hold you back from expressing genuine concern and empathy. Number two, dream big and embrace your ambitions. Hardeep encouraged listeners to dream big and never settle for mediocrity. By envisioning ambitious goals and pursuing them with determination, we can unlock our true potential and achieve extraordinary things. Number three, surround yourself with uplifting people. The company we keep plays a crucial role in our journey to success. Hardeep stressed the importance of surrounding ourselves with positive, uplifting individuals who believe in our dreams and support us unconditionally. These people can inspire us and provide guidance and help us navigate the challenges. Number four, seek support of overcoming workplace barriers. Hardy highlighted that individuals and businesses could find support from the government and organisations like Kaleidoscope to address barriers faced by people with disabilities in the workplace. By tapping into these resources, we can create a more inclusive and accessible working environment for everyone. Number five, embrace the value of diversity and differences. Hardy emphasised the importance of being open-minded and embracing the unique perspectives that contributions of individuals within disabilities and differences can bring. These individuals bring unexpected values to businesses, including loyalty and commercial benefits. We can unlock innovation and create a thriving workplace and culture by fostering a diverse and inclusive environment. Number six, understand your drivers and have a plan. Knowing your personal drivers, purpose, motivation and passion is crucial when embarking on an entrepreneurial journey. Hardeep stressed the importance of resilience as the number one skill in entrepreneurship, accompanied by the intuition to listen to your inner consciousness when something feels off. It's essential to have a realistic, structured and intelligent plan to guide your path towards meaningful change. In this episode, Hardeep also touched upon the significance of seeking advice from experts or mentors, listening to the success stories from others in your desired field, understanding your target customers and route to market, disregarding naysayers, and staying focused on your customer and how you can make a difference. Additionally, he emphasised the importance of writing down your vision, mission and goals to guide your entrepreneurial journey. But The Switch is also about you. 
And as the series continues to grow, we'll be taking your questions for our guests. Are you content with your life right now, your career? Are you considering to make a switch of your own? Or maybe you're looking for a new direction or motivation to take a step up. Whatever your situation, I hope that this show is inspirational for you.